Okay, we're in the book of Jude. As I told you, I, I, I called this like the little but fierce series. I just want to look at all the little books. Before we head outside for the summertime, which by the way will start in June. In June, we'll head out to the park, to outside, and um, we're going to do a summer in the Psalms time. But until then, I thought it'd be fun to look at all these like little books of the Bible. Most of them, like, we all know their names, but nobody knows what they're about, so it's kind of fun to get to talk about them. Obadiah, when do you ever look at Obadiah, right? Um, Jude, everybody's like, oh, Jude's awesome. What's Jude about? Nobody knows what Jude's about. Nobody has a clue. So we're going um, to finish it up tonight. We're going to pick up in verse 9. We didn't get very far. We're going to move a little bit quicker tonight. If you were here the last time we were talking about this, I mentioned to you that Jude tells us that he is... He wanted to write a unifying gospel letter that just was about what Jesus did and how excited he is about who God is and the work of God. But he felt really strongly that he needed to write a letter warning the believers about a particular type of person and a group of people. And he describes this type of person as somebody who is in the, in the church, potentially, but that is poison to the church. And I think that, and so we're going to continue with that line of thinking. And a part of what I want you to remember, and we, we talked about this last week, it's, it's really important. This is not just like a bad person, like, oh, these are evil, terrible people. In one sense, there, there's that. But on the other hand, all of Scripture is given for us to, to, to teach us something. So we want to stop and be like the disciples when Jesus said, you know, one of you is going to betray me. What did they say? Is it, is it me? Like, am I a part of the problem or am I a part of the solution? And so we want to just use the opportunity to kind of glean for our own lives. But of course, the main purpose here that Jude is writing about is a warning. He's warning about people that have crept into the church who ultimately they're poison to, the, to, to, to Christians. They look good. They sound good. But there's, there's things there that you and I might say, oh, that seems a little weird, but... And Jude says, no, it's worse than that. And then he explains why. So we're kind of picking up in the middle of a thought, which begins in verse 9, and he talks about Michael the archangel. Okay, he says this, Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare to bring against him a reviling accusation, but he said this, the Lord rebuke you. This is one of those like fun Jude verses that is like, what in the world is he talking about? But we're going to keep it within our own context here. He speaks about this, um, about this blasphemy that is happening. And it's a difficult verse. Um, we would have never known that this has actually happened except that Jude tells us this. So did you know that? No other part in the Bible talks about this. You can't read it. We just finished Deuteronomy and we never read this right? Do you remember that? It was not there. It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, when Lucifer and uh, when Michael and, you know, no, that never happened. Jude tells us that it happens. And here's the situation. They were fighting over the bones of Moses. Of course, it's a lot of fun and interesting to talk about the, the question, why? And there's a lot of good, smart people that have given reasons why they think these things are happening. Um, I'll give you, I'll just mention a couple and then you can you're not going to solve it. Nobody has. So I'll just give you a few of the different options. And you can say, hey, I like that. That makes sense to me. Uh, one is this. Moses is going to be resurrected in the days of the tribulation. It seems very clear. The Bible tells us that Moses is coming back. He's going to be preaching righteousness once again. And so in some kind of mysterious way, the bones of Moses mattered at that time. Not because God couldn't raise Moses without them. It's just that there was value uh, to securing Moses' bones from Lucifer at that time. One, that's, that's a possibility. Why not? Another one is this. The early church fathers, Origen, one of the uh, very, kind of everybody knows about Origen. He, he wrote quite a bit. He was a church father, and he says that there was a book called The Assumption of Moses. And in it, Jude is referencing from that book. So Origen says Jude is referencing this other book, and he is referencing this moment when you know, Lucifer and Michael fight over the bones of uh, Moses. If that's true, it's a good possibility, but we have no idea. What we do know is this. Michael takes an approach to dealing with Lucifer that Jude is encouraging you and I to take approach with, with people in our lives. That's the main 
crux of what he's trying to say here, okay? We miss that when we get super excited about, wait, Moses and Bones and Satan and Michael, it's super cool. But the main point is to tell us, make sure that you hear the lesson about why Michael rebuked the devil rather than like fight with him and do all these things. So we don't want to get stuck with that. Here's the main point. Michael did not revile against the devil. If there was anyone who did, and the word revile means to blaspheme, to come against, to speak against. If there's anyone in the world that deserves to be spoken against, wouldn't you agree it's the devil? And yet Michael just says, I'm not even, I'm not going to do that. I just, the Lord rebuke you. I'm not going after you. I'm not going to make this my mission. The Lord rebuke you. I'm going to let the Lord deal with you. And Jude's point is this. If Michael didn't speak against the devil and he just said, the Lord rebuke you, then, uh, then we need to take the same approach when we are dealing with those who are poison within the church. And again, he's still developing what that means. But we need to be aware of the fact that maybe, you know, you're not going to move that person by your argument. There's a point when you just say, you know what, the Lord's got to deal with that. I'm not going to fix this problem in a five-minute conversation, in a one-hour conversation. I'm not going to move this person from their, their position. I just got to, you know what, the Lord's got to deal with that. Um, the word rebuke means to help people to remember what they could be in Christ. That's an ultimate, that's a, the church fathers described rebuking as the goal is to bring restoration into their lives. So we don't rebuke to the say, you know, I don't just say, oh, you know, I rebuke you and then just get out of here and I never want to see you again. No, the idea is this. I want to see restoration in people's lives. Okay, let, let, let's move on because I want to get to the crux of this. Verse 10. But these, and he's speaking about those that are poisoned to the church, they speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things, they corrupt themselves. The people that Jude is warning us about don't let the fact that they don't know something keep them from having an opinion. <laughs> we probably all know people like that, right? Do you know what you're talking about? No, I don't, they don't know what they're talking about, but they have an opinion about it. And Jude says, you know, we've got to be careful about these kinds of people. Those that have an opinion about everything but don't know what they're talking about. It's a dangerous person who presents themselves as an expert but doesn't bother with the facts. Right? You don't know what you're talking about, but you seem to have an opinion on everything. And I would even suggest this as Christians for you and me, something to consider. You know, the Bible encourages us, like, be ready to give an answer to every man who would answer, you know, or who would ask, you know. And in, there's that sense in which we have that feeling of like, gosh, I got to know what I'm talking about. And I'm a big fan, and let's, let's make ourselves as well-versed as we possibly could. But there's an, there's an answer out there that is really healing to a lot of people when Christians say it. And the answer is this. I don't know. That's a powerful answer when you don't know. Now, again, they ask you a question and you know the answer. Don't be falsely humble and be like, I don't know. You know if you know something, share it. But it's okay. You and I are not the end all of every answer. Okay? God is, but we might not know certain things. It's okay to be like, I, I'm not sure. And so um, there's this, the, uh, Jude is warning about people who say, they, 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 they possess this idea of like, I'm an expert in this thing, but they really, Jude says, they don't know what they're talking about. And then he uses this word to corrupt. They corrupt themselves. The word corrupt means literally to rot or to wither. They're withering. The way that they're living is causing themselves to, be, to become corrupted, to become rotted, to become withered. Um, they're building themselves up, and as they put others down, it's ultimately causing them to shrink up. It's not making them better. It's actually, it's, 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 it's removing who they could be for this persona that they want to present to all of us. And Jude's saying, we need to be very careful of those. Look, at, in fact, he says this, woe to them, verse 11, for they have gone in the way of Cain. This is the, this is the fourth example. They've gone the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. And they've perished in the rebellion of Korah. So he gives three more examples of the, you know, these kinds of people that can in, uh, get infected into the church. They're poisoned to the church, but we might not recognize it. And he says, but listen, it's nothing new. This is the same stuff that was happening. And then he mentions three more situations. The, the way of Cain. Cain was jealous of Abel's sacrifice. And so he killed his brother. Okay? He didn't like that God accepted Abel 
And he didn't want to be in second place. He didn't like the fact that his sacrifice was not received by God. And so he killed his brother. That's the sin of Cain. Nobody will be higher than me. Nobody, my brother's not any better than I am. His sacrifice was no better than mine. How dare God only accept that one and not mine? It's that just insolence. I cannot handle the fact that somebody else was, ex- was accepted and I was not. And then lashing out at that. And, and, and Jude says, be so careful of those kinds of people. Woe to them. Okay? Or the error of Balaam, which was, Balaam was the one, and we, we looked at this not that long ago. He sold his integrity for financial gain. He, he cared more about making some money than his own integrity and his own character. God kept telling him, do not curse my people. But Balaam just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and working his own way into getting his way because he had a possibility to really benefit. And so we we see Jude's warning is this. There's people who can seem so spiritual, but when integrity is on the line, they might choose a lack of integrity for their integrity in that moment. If there's something for them to gain, they might go that way at that moment. It takes a rare kind of a person who could say, no, I'm not going to trade on my integrity for my own benefit. And Jude says, listen, you got to be careful of those kinds of people. Now, let me, let me take it back. Not just a warning, but isn't that true for all of us? It made me, I'm reading that. I'm thinking, okay, I don't think I'm in a woe to them place, but I don't want that to be me, Lord. I don't want to be in a, Lord, don't let me get in a spot where I would have to, where I could be, where it's a, between my integrity or financial or like personal gain. That's a tough spot to be into. And Lord, protect us from ever having to be in that kind of a situation where you have to, where you have to choose. In that. You, you don't ever want to trade on your integrity. Balaam is in the Bible as the guy that traded on his integrity. For all of eternity, that's, that's what he's known for, for his own benefit. And woe to him and woe to those who would think that way. And finally, Korah. And once again, you can tell that Jude is writing to people who know their Old Testament. All his analogies are Old Testament based. So these guys knew the Old Testament. Korah, we read about him in Numbers 16. Korah rose up. Korah, it's ironic. Korah tried to bring democracy to Israel, (laughs) which you'd say today, that's great. That's awesome. No, it was a theocracy, and he wanted to bring a democracy. God was working through Moses, and Korah says, this is not working. This is not a good plan. Moses is too busy. Moses is not better than any of the rest of us. Why can't we all be leaders? Korah's argument in number 16, we read it. We looked at it for quite a while. Korah's argument in number 16, if you just read it, he sounds totally right. Like you read it and you go, yeah, that kind of, I get the logic. Like spread the responsibility. Share, and, and God comes into it and he says, dude, that's evil what you're doing right now. It's wicked. I didn't call you to that. And again, Korah stands out as a person who tried to take something that God never gave them. You know, God was working through Moses. And it's not because Moses was better, but God was using Moses, and Korah wanted what Moses had. And God said, that's not going to happen. And so there's this warning that we need to, you know, um, not assume something that is not ours. We have to let God be the one who establishes those things. Almost in this sense, I would say Jude is implying this point. When you give yourself authority or you challenge the authority of those God has called, that's the same sin as Korah. I don't believe, and I've said this to you guys, I think, several times. And you'll hear me say it several times. I don't just believe in this kind of carte blanche, like authority for the sake of authority. I think if somebody has to prove to you that they deserve respect, they probably aren't going to get it. You better respect me. You lost it already. I'm in charge. You're not in charge. If you have to convince people you're in charge, you're not in charge. Something's gone wrong is the point that I'm trying to make there. And so I don't believe in this kind of just this blind, like I just follow and do whatever. The Bereans are, my, are our example. They, they listened to the word of God from Paul. They said, gosh, that's not what I've ever heard before. I've never heard that. So I'm going to get into the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, Great. And they looked at it, and they found the scriptures, and they said, that's exactly what the Bible says. And it says many of them got saved at that time. That's the kind of people I think we should be. Paul earned respect because he was preaching to them the word of God, and he was living a life of integrity. And that's what I think anybody that's in any position of leadership should 
That should be the goal. But those who try to either take authority or usurp authority from those that God has given it to, that's the sin of Korah. That's a dangerous thing. It's dangerous to put ourselves in that kind of position. We all need to learn how to express our concerns in our hearts. There's nothing wrong or evil about that at all. But what Jude is talking about are those who reject They reject authority. I I know so many people, I haven't met too many down here yet, but in my lifetime, so many that are like, oh, I don't like church, I don't like leaders, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't need any thought, I just need the nature and God. And you know, the truth of the matter is that sounds super peace, love, and kumbaya for today, but it's wrong. The Bible says, behold how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. So we are meant to be a family together. And so when, when I get this idea of, I just, I want away from it all. I don't want it. I want to be away from that. That's not coming from the Lord. That's demonic. It's not a good th- thought. I had some friends who, they were in the church that I was pastoring for a long time, and they told me they had gotten burned out by people and frustrated, and, and they left. They left the church completely, you know, and it took them years to be able to get back into that. I understand people can feel hurt, and, and, and um, you know, like uh, taken advantage of and all that kind of stuff. But, but at the same time, let me just remind you. You know, like if you're having, if you're not doing good, I promise you, you'll have this thought in your mind, I'm just going to skip church. It's amazing. When you're doing awesome, you're like, I can't wait to get to it. I want people to see I'm doing awesome. <laughs> if, I'm, if life's sucking, I don't want anybody to see it. It's totally demonic. The only, you know when we really need to be at church? When life is terrible. there's no reason to pull away at that moment. So just a reminder that if there's that tension in you of like, gosh, I just need to get away, it's not the Lord. You and I are working in, we're working in unity together to make each other better in Jesus' name. It's iron sharpening iron. And I mentioned this, I think, last week. It's such a cute verse, iron sharpening iron. But have you ever seen iron sharpening iron? Sparks, clashes, frustrations, friction. Now, how does that sound in your relationships? It's terrible, but it's necessary. It makes us better people. And so if there's, I love the church, and here's why I love the church, because it's made up of totally different people under one banner, the name of Jesus. That's so cool. Where else would you, every other club or institution or social gathering, you gather around a particular interest, What is our interest? Our interest is Jesus and the kingdom of God. And we're all different and we're all unique and it makes us better people because of that. And Jude warns against this idea of I can go off and do my own thing because I'm my own person and I just need me and God. I can, let me tell you, even as the pastor here, I don't need just me and God. I need you. I need you. You need each other. We all need each other. That's the way God made his kingdom. We are meant to be in fellowship together. No islands. We're a team. Verse 12. These, and I love what he says about these people. He's talking about people that are like this. They are spots in your love feasts. (laughs) Jude, how do you really feel about these people? They are spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, they're serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, Pulled up by the roots. He's not done. Raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And then the music goes dun, dun, dun. This is like, he really kind of lays it out like, these people are like bums, okay? Low life. These are the worst. You know? And then he gives all these kinds of analogies. There's spots. There's spots in your love feasts, you know? Um, interesting, the, the idea there is like, you know, what sank the Titanic? Right? An iceberg, right? Something, it's the same word used here. There's spots in your love feasts. And what he's trying to say is this. You're not seeing that they're there, but they're right below the surface, and they're there. These are not the, these are not the people that scream, I am a heretic. I am not a Christian. I am not one of you. I am against you. It's not these people. These are the ones that are right below the surface of the water that if you let your life go over that, 
it could shipwreck you. That's what Jude is trying to say. These are spots in your love feast. These people are there, and they're, don't look around like, where are they? I'm not, uh, uh, that, that's not what he's, you know, don't nudge the person next to you, you know. It's you, isn't it? Yeah. He, this is the church global. He's not talking about one local body. He's saying as a, the church lo, the global, there are people that have come in that really are, are, are icebergs waiting for you to, they want you to, they're drawing you in to let you roll your life over theirs and they will sink you. It's a strong analogy, but that's literally what he says here. These people, Jude says, are serving, but not the body and not God. They're serving themselves. We need to hear this. This is a question that I, I think about a lot. Am I doing this for me or for God? Do I need, am I in a place in life where I need affirmation so I do what I do? Or am I doing this because it's the Lord? And I think that's a question every one of us should kind of wrestle with regularly. Regularly. Like, am I doing this? Am I? I am looking around. A lot of you serve in different ministries here all the time. And you should ask yourself that question. Am I doing this so that, am I doing this for, like, am I needing something? Or am I just receiving from God, but I'm really doing this for God? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I have benefited so much more from me serving God than I've ever given to God. I truly believe that. I've gotten more than I've given. I believe that's biblical, too. You will never outgive God. You'll never outgive God. However, if I'm doing it for my own emotional safety or security, I'm in need of the praise of people, I'm, I'm, about, to, I'm about to sink. No, instead... I, I want to serve God because my life is so full of God that there's overflow. There's room for me to spill out. There's room for God to move. Does that make sense? Jude describes these people as clouds without water. Now, let me just mention the idea of service just in one more way. And I had a, um, uh, one of the assistant pastors when I was a youth pastor, he used to say, uh, Pastor Romaine, he would say this to us all the time just meaner than I even know how to say it. But he said, you'll find out if you're a servant by the way you re react when people treat you like one. And he'd, he'd yell that at, at us all the time. He was a drill sergeant in the Marine Corps. You'll know, right? You'll know if you're a servant by the way you react when people treat you like one. And that, he, that, was, that was really good. That's a good advice. If, if I'm, tr you know, if I'm setting up chairs and somebody, you know, or I'm getting things ready for the kids' ministry and some kid comes over and knocks over all the chairs that I just set up, you know, do I yell at him like, get back in here, sit up the chairs, I work so hard, da, 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 da. or do I just like, okay, Lord, whatever. Little brat, but whatever, I'll do, you know, right? <laughs> right, you know, or, or like, or, or do you need people to recognize what you're doing? Do you need affirmation? Now, let me answer that before you do. The answer is Yes. Every one of us in here needs affirmation. We all do. Okay, so now let me ask it a little different. Are you okay with God affirming you in your life, or do you have to get it from people? That's really, the issue of whether we need affirmation is not on the table. The answer is yes. Every one of us does. I was, I was hearing from a, a young girl in our school who was saying, you know, she'd been bullied so many years of her life and had such a, it's kind of been a problem. She's, Honestly, she's been kind of a, she's been difficult. And then you find out why she's being difficult, because it was difficult for her, so she just likes to take it out on everybody else. It's not logical, but it, it, I understand it. And then she heard a, a chapel recently, and the person just kept saying over and over, like, you guys are loved by God. You are valuable. If people have told you you're not, they're, it's a lie. That's demonic. God loves you. God's for you. Just kind of pouring in just hope into these, and and it was for her, it was for this young girl. This was like, it was like a turning point. If it lasts, you know, we'll see. I, I believe it will. She just like, it's the first time I've been told that I'm good. Not good as in like I'm awesome, but that God loves me and God's for me and that I don't have to continue to be the way that I've been. And I think every one of us is in need of affirmation. You can't tell me that you don't need that. The question is, if God's the one that wants to affirm you, will that be enough for you? 
Or do you need everybody around you to pat you on the back and tell you how awesome you are? Or is it enough that God comes and says, you are awesome, and I love you? And so I can serve, and you can serve, not because people tell me I'm amazing, but because God's already told me I'm amazing. And because of that, I'm just, like, excited, okay? So they're clouds without waters, trees without fruit. That means they have the appearance of good, but nothing good's coming from it. It's like, oh, yeah, it's, there's clouds. Yay, it's going to rain. Oh, look at that tree. It's going to produce great fruit, but there's no fruit. Jude says these people are wandering stars. What that means is they seem to themselves, they think they're stars, but they're, they're not. They're just wandering. He gives another example, Enoch, verse 14. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, and he said, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints, and he's executing judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they've committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He uses the word ungodly an ungodly amount of times in, this, in these couple sentences. Again, this is the only time we read of Enoch saying these words. There is no Old Testament passage where it says this, but Jude says Enoch prophesied these things. Um, Enoch prophesied about people who would experience judgment in the flood, and Jude says the same truths that Enoch was prophesying then are still true today. There's an ungodliness about these people. It might sound godly. It might look godly, but it's a below-the-surface poison. It's a below-the-surface destruction. These are, verse 16, grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Grumblers are people who always see things wrong. Complainers are people who don't like what God has done in their life. Complain, when I'm complaining, I'm saying what God's done for me is not enough. Ultimately, that's complaining. Okay? Grumbling are people that can always see things wrong. And then he says this, they walk according to their own lusts. It means that they're driven by their own passions. In fact, literally, it means to begin to breathe heavy. It means they don't, they don't have control of their own emotions. They get out of control. They're just, they get fired up. Anything can light them up and they can get really passionate and out of control and they, they don't have any self-control. They're, they're people that always have to have something that, is, that they're fighting against. And, and I, I see that, I see that especially in this American context. Everybody wants something to be mad about. And then when we don't have something to be mad about, we find something to be mad about. And it's almost like anger is a way of showing that's our new passion. But it's not the way God wants to reach his world. It's not, it's not the emotion that God is going for. Passion can express itself in so many other ways, but there's people that just want to grumble and complain. They're always worked up about something. They're driven by their own desires. Um, and so he says, you need to be careful of those people. You need to watch out for those kinds of people. Um, look out for, he, he speaks about those who are, their, their mouths swell with great words. They're flattering people to gain advantage. Anybody in this room that's been in any kind of leadership position will tell you this is true. Here it is. Are you ready? This is true. Anybody in any kind of leadership position will tell you this is true. The people that are flattering you the most are the ones that are about to tear you down. They're at, they're They're coming. The ones that are like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Oh, you're so great. Oh, da, 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 da. They're just putting steps on the pedestal and then they're going to pull it out. Flattery. Flattery is a dangerous thing. Compliments and affirmation are positive things. What he's speaking about is a negative here. The people that are like, oh yeah, they're trying to convince themselves that they like you. <laughs> you're amazing. You're great. What they're trying to say is, I'm trying to believe in you. I'm trying to like you but they're having a hard time doing that. Be careful of those that are just flattering you for the sake of flattery. Um, there's a difference between encouragement and flattery, and I believe the difference is this. You ready? Encouragement appeals to our spirit. Flattery appeals to our ego. So somebody could be encouraging you, and it's like it feeds your, your spirit. You're like, that, that was affirming and encouraging. Flattery just goes for the ego. 
It does no long-term benefits. Verse 17, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Jude reminds the readers that the apostles wrote about these things. There are those whose passion will eventually drive a wedge between you. But verse 19, these are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. Now, that word sensual gets so, con- it's like, that doesn't fit. What is he trying to say? The word sensual means soulless, lacking a soul. It, it was eventually, we used it in a, in a very, we used it in a, in a, that became romantic and sexual. It is, that's not what the original meant. It meant to lack a soul. He's writing about people, and so what does that mean? He's writing about people who are driven by soul issues, not spirit issues. Now, how do I tell the difference between a, a, the soul and the spirit? That's a great question that is hard to answer. Here's why. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we read this. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing between the division of soul and spirit. What, what the writer is saying is this. God's word is so sharp to the issues of our lives that he can cut right between soul and spirit. What that means is that the distinction between soul and spirit is so close, we need the word of God to come in and cut in between that. Let me use an example. Worship can be a very soulish experience. What does that mean? What I mean by that is I, it can appeal to my soul, to my emotion, to my feelings. To, and I tell you what, I love it. I love that. I love passion and worship, and I love, I love that stuff so much. But when it only appeals to my soul, my spirit will go hungry. And so I've, I've sat in times of worship when it was like, man, that was the coolest thing ever, but it didn't really connect to the spir- my spirit. And I've been in worship sessions with people, you know, when, uh, you know, I mean, I, in, in one of the churches that I started in Hungary, um, it was either me doing the worship or this other dude, and he was a blind guy. <laughs> he was blind, and he was an awesome worship leader. But, um, you know, I mean, he knew a few chords, and he had a beautiful voice, and he loved Jesus, and we could just, you know, he knew a few chords, but I tell you what, it was spiritual. What I'm trying to say is this. It's not one or the other. You can have them both. But there's, there's those who appeal to our soul. Forget worship for a moment. We can easily appeal to the soul, but God's saying, I want to reach the spirit. It needs to go deeper. And so there are those who cause division, okay? He says there in verse 19, they cause division because why? They don't have the spirit. Literally, it means they separate themselves this idea of discord, and we've already spoken about that quite a bit, but the church, the church of Jesus Christ is one church. We're not divided. And so those that are appealing to the soul, the emotion only, they want to separate themselves from what is a part of what God's doing. Um, it's why the Bible says this. Just, just quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll step off track just a second. Jesus says that if you have something against your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go make things right. Why? Because God cares about unity. God cares about it. Like, don't bring me this gift and be all angry with somebody else. Leave it there, go get things right, and then let's talk again. God cares about our unity. It really matters to him. And there's a reason why the Bible says, strive to enter into the unity of the brethren. Strive. Unity does not come naturally. Did you know that? Friendship does with people that are like you. Oh, I like them. They like me. That's cool. That was easy. But the Bible doesn't say have unity with people you like. It says have unity with each other. And that requires striving. And we all think that striving is bad. Bad striving is bad. But there's a good striving. Good striving says this. I will fight for unity. I will fight for you. And I shared this with you. I've talked to so many married couples, you know, in, like, or in premarital, they say, oh, we're, especially the premarital, they'll say, oh, we, we, we fought and we feel so bad that we fought, and, but everything's better. We worked it out. And we'll usually say, I'm so excited for you. You learn how to work through a problem. That's pretty awesome. 
before you get married, that's a good thing to have to do, you know. And I always try to tell them, like, listen, you're going to fight in your marriage, so let's start fighting for your marriage. And as a church, I could say this. There's going to be fighting in the church. Let's make sure we fight for the church. Let's fight for unity. Giving up is not the solution. We fight for unity because it matters, okay? Um, let me put it into a different context. If you broke your finger, do you cut it off? <laughs> Oh, man, I broke my pinky. Amputation is the only answer. Are you insane? Dude, there's like a way better way to do that. First of all, when, you're, when one part of you is hurt, the rest of your body starts working to help the body, that part. That's pretty amazing. You don't have to amputate just because it's broken. It can be mended. Just because, listen, if it's not been clear to you before, let's make sure it's abundantly clear right now. The church is made up of broken parts that all together create a mosaic that is beautiful. But individually, we're all broken. And you know, one broken person looking at another broken person looks at that broken person and says, man, that person's broken. They are broke. Because it's so easy to see other people's brokenness than your own brokenness. Because you look at you and you're like, I'm pretty normal. And the, the, I think the definition of insanity is when you think you're the standard of norm. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm normal. Whoa, whoa. First of all, when did normal become exciting, right? I mean, who cares about normal? There's no normal. God didn't make, there's no norm at all. We're all just individual, crazy, unique, broken pieces that brought together in Christ create a beautiful mosaic. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So, you know, we have to strive for unity. We need to work towards unity. That means that if I'm, if I'm seeing somebody that's broken in the body, why is my first reaction distance? It's, it's evil in the end. It's just wrong. No, my first reaction, like it, when I break a finger, the rest of my body doesn't try to like cut it off. You cut yourself, what does your body do? It begins to rush blood there to coagulate and to move and to create healing for that part that is hurt. So that's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be too. When someone's broken and hurting, they're going to do dumb, hurting, broken stuff. They're going to lash out. They're going to be mean. They're going to be mean-spirited. They're going to say things they don't mean. They're going to say things they do mean and they shouldn't mean. They're going to be, they're going to be a pain. And yet we have this thing of, oh, I just need to get away from that. Maybe that's not the answer only. Maybe there's another way. What if we all, what if all of us were to say, I'm striving for unity. Dude, you're broken and you're not getting away from us. What if, what if we did that? There's a, there's a better way. I think that's the way that Jesus wants for us. Verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I love what Jude, Jude is like said, these people are poisoned, they're wicked, they're evil, they're of this, they're of this sin, and this sin, and this sin, and they're fruitless trees, waterless clouds, you know, they're icebergs waiting to sink your life. And you're like, dang, I hope that's not me. And then he says this, but you, beloved, that's not you. I'm not talking about you, he says. That's not who you are. You're so much more than that. And he says, you be praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? One, one part of that is the Bible speaks about the gift of tongues, a gift that God gives where we can pray, even sometimes in a tongue that's unknown to us. But there's another part of what it means to pray in the Holy Spirit. And I believe Paul talks about it in Romans when he says this. There's times in life, well, let, let, let me ask the question. Has there ever been a time in your life when you like were desperate for God and you didn't have words to describe what you were trying, what you were feeling? You ever felt something but you didn't have words to describe it? Anybody in here like that? Yeah. And you're like, the only thing that comes out is like, oh, mm, you know, ah, I can't do it because I don't have a voice. Silence, right? You just, there's something in you and you're like, God, mm. And you know what Romans 8 tells us? That the Holy Spirit interprets those groanings. The Holy Spirit interprets groanings into words. And so, like, there's God. It's like basically talking to a two-year-old if it's not your two-year-old. 
Have you ever found how, like, all of us parents can interpret our two-year-old's words? It's like a two-year-old comes up and is like, ah, nah, 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 nah. And I look at him and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said, you know. And then mom comes and she's like, no, that's not what we're going to do right now. I'm like, what in the heck just happened? You know, what did you? <laughs> I heard the voice from Charlie Brown, you know, wah, 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 you know. And yet, you know, they heard, you know, we took our, 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 our um, grandson was in town. We took him to the zoo, and he is a huge Buzz Lightyear fan. And so, of course, we have a big Buzz Lightyear because that's what we do, right? And so we went to the zoo, and he loves animals. We thought, oh, this could be so, just me and Joy, and like, oh, this is so awesome. And I kid you not, all day long, he wanted to show Buzz to every animal. <laughs> so we'd go to the turtles, and he's like, Buzz? Buzz? But he doesn't say buzz, it's biz. And of course, you know, and these kids would walk by, and every kid would walk by and go, Buzz Lightyear to the rescue. Every kid walked by, every kid walked by and would say their little Buzz Lightyear phrase. And, and when my grandson would hear it, he would kind of start talking to them. But it wasn't in any, like, it was like one and a half year old words. Like there was no, it's like he was trying to connect, right? And you think, sometimes I feel like that. Like, God, there's so much that's in my heart and in my mind that I want to say, and I can't get the words to say it. It just doesn't seem to come out right. And the Holy Spirit says, I got you. I got that. I know what that's like. I know, I know what you're saying. I can translate that to the Father for you. So praying in the Holy Spirit. So listen, if you don't have the words, you can say that too. God interprets groanings. He's good with that. God's okay with that. And then he says this, keep yourselves in the love of God. God loves even the ungodly. So Jude doesn't mean live in such a way to make yourself lovable to God. That's not what it means. Jude is not saying make sure that you live a life that makes you lovable to God. That's not what it means when he says keep yourselves in the love of God. Instead, to keep yourself in the love of God means to keep yourself in harmony with God's love. Just keep yourself in harmony. Just allow yourself to be in a place where you can receive the love of God. Don't move outside of God's love for your life, okay? The fact that God, listen, this is a quote from uh, Guzik. D D David said this, and I, I loved it. I think I'll put it up here. I think it'll go up there. The fact that God loves the ungodly is a reflection on God's goodness, not his own. The perspective is not, I'm so great that even God loves me, but God is so great that, even, that he loves even me. I think that's the way we have to look at keeping myself in the love of God. It's not that I'm so lovable, but isn't it odd? The fact that God loves me shows how incredible God is. And that's a good thing. It's not self-deprecating to say that. It's a positive thing. God is so loving that he loves us. God's love extends everywhere. And then he says this, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. One of the ways that you and I can keep ourselves in the love of God is to keep building ourselves up in our most holy faith. Keep growing in your relationship with Jesus. I promise you that the, 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 the spring of God's love becomes a, a drip if you're not building yourself up in your faith. As you grow, you can experience new freshness. The same joy you got from the love of God when you first got saved might not be the same joy you experience tonight. And that's no different than like a marriage that's been going for a long time. Love grows. And the same well, if you're trying to dig the same well that you've experienced when you first got married, you might have to readjust a little bit right here and there. It, you know, the same things that brought you joy um, in uh, one moment, maybe it's not going to be the same thing, but it could be even better. We just have to keep growing in our relationship with the Lord. Build yourselves up in your faith. Verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a distinction but on others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. You know, just quickly, what Jude is saying here is this. Jude is saying, you need to be a discerning person. There's people in your life that are broken that need your, they need you to just come alongside and give them a big hug. It's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. There's other people in your life that might need a little bit of a kick. This, I mean, that's what he's saying here. Now, here's the thing. Make sure you're not deciding which one they get. Make sure that you're asking the Lord. Does that make sense? Oh, I know what they need. You might be right, you might be wrong. The better question is this, Lord, what do they need? And so then when you know what they need, 
then, then do that. Be discerning. Have discernment. How do you have discernment? You got to be building yourself up in your faith. You got to keep yourself in the love of God. Okay? Verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Able to keep you from stumbling. I love that phrase. It's actually one of my favorite phrases. To him who is able to keep me from stumbling. I am painfully aware of the capacity that I have to literally mess everything up in my life. <laughs> Yay, right? Isn't, that, isn't it? I mean, I'm asking you to think about it just for a second, and then, I, and then we want to end on a good note, though. So. <laughs> but isn't it true? Like, if you, if you give yourself the moment to consider, like, I could mess everything up. I have that within me. It's terrifying. But there's a greater truth, and that's a powerful truth, by the way, but there's a greater truth. And here's the greater truth. God is able to keep us from stumbling. As good as I might be at messing everything up, God is greater at keeping me. Let that sink into your life tonight. Because some of us are making decisions because we're so afraid. I don't want to mess things up. I don't want to mess things up. And we can be so afraid of not messing things up that we stop living. We stop taking the risks that we need to for the Lord. I don't want to say something wrong to them, so we say nothing at all. I don't want to mess up the relationship, so we don't say anything about the gospel ever. I was just talking to my, my high school class about this. And can I just remind you of something? My experience with people in the world, I love talking to people who don't know the Lord. I love talking about the Lord. I love evangelizing. I think I, I like, I'm, I feel very comfortable talking to non-Christians. You know what I've discovered? Nobody has a problem talking about spiritual things if I do it in a normal way. I'm serious. If I cut out the Christianese and I talk English, people like to talk. I remember we were on our way on a, um, we were going back to Hungary. We were here and we were going back with a team from Calvary San Diego. And Brian Newberry, Pastor Brian, was on the trip with us. He was coming back. I don't know if you remember this. You probably don't, but or maybe you do. We were going back to Hungary. Now, we were already living there, but we were visiting here and then just going back with a team. And we're at the airport in some, I don't know, somewhere in Europe, like a stop off somewhere. I have no idea. When I fly, I just don't care. I don't think about it. I just try to just do it, right? And I remember sitting there, and I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to read a book or pretend I'm not a human being for a while, and... And I could hear Brian sharing his faith with somebody. Natural, normal. That's the way we're supposed to talk to people. Just natural and normal. You'd be amazed. If you are afraid that they're going to not like, be interested in talking about spiritual things, can I just, let me just tell you, I'm serious about this. If you're normal, it won't be weird. People will be open to a conversation. I was talking to this person, I was talking to a guy later, I'm like, hey, I'm seriously curious about a question. You probably haven't been asked this in a long time. What's going to happen to you when you die? He's like, dang, but he didn't say that, <laughs> okay? And he's like, that's, whoa, dude, why are you, that's like too deep. And I'm like, I know, but like nobody ever talks about it, and it's going to happen to all of us, so let's talk about it. I'm a Christian. I, I feel good about where I'm at. I'm just curious. You don't have to believe like I believe, but we can at least talk about this. We had an amazing conversation. It's, you, we can do that. Don't be afraid of that. And the reason I'm, I'm encouraging in that is because I've, been afraid way too many times. I've been afraid way too many times. Oh, they're not going to like me. I'm going to mess it up, blah, blah, blah. Just listen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. God could hold you up. Are you feeling like you're going to fall? Can you know this tonight? God could hold you up. If you will let the Lord, he'll hold you up. He'll hold you up tonight. And he's able to keep you. Now, let me just finish with this thought. I love that he says that God is able to keep you. Why is that important? Because I've always had this feeling that I'm supposed to keep myself. God saves, and then now i got to do my parts. But what the Bible says is this. God saves you, and he'll keep you. God saves you, and he's going to establish you. He's going to keep you from stumbling, and he's going to keep you. God is able to to keep you. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. One more thought, but all in, Carlos, you, John, you guys want to, we'll, we'll close in a song of worship. Um, 
Jude gives us all this kind of wisdom. It's a lot of warning. It's a whole, he's all over the place, but he's, he's got a lot of great wisdom to give from God. Um, and then Jude kind of brings it all back to this, okay? And I think it's really important. Because I get confused, like, okay, wait, what's the sin of Korah and Balaam and this and that? And it, 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 it becomes too much. And then he brings it all back to this. God alone is wise. And, and so here's what I want us to end with. And then we'll, we'll, we'll close in a song of worship. But here's what I want us to kind of have in our heads is this. If there's anything that we would walk away from Jude, it's this. That we would accept that, there, that God alone has all wisdom. And here, here's what I mean by that. When I begin to accept that it's like God's wisdom is what I need, then I will listen to what he says. I will believe what he says. I'll obey what he says. It really does start with you and I accepting the fact that God alone is, has all wisdom. So I guess the challenge for us tonight is that. Do, do you really believe that God is the source of all wisdom? But then you have to live that. And that's the maybe encouragement and exhortation. And I love how he ends there. He ends it just with praise. To God alone be glory. So let's allow ourselves the opportunity to really consider, Lord, where in my life is, am I lacking in that kind of, um, where you're my wisdom? And let's close in a song of worship and enjoy just the fact that to God alone is all honor and glory and praise and wisdom. Father, thank you so much that there is there is a source that comes from you of endless love. There's a place, Lord, where we can be where there is no end, God, to where you can hold us up and keep us from stumbling. And I'm so thankful, God, that tonight we could look at this, this little book, but, man, just tons of stuff in it. Bless us, Lord, as we have given time to your word. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is strengthening and encouraging you in your faith. We would love for you to download our app and share your story of how God is working in your life. Also, if you would like to invest in the ministry of Calvary San Diego, you can financially partner with us by visiting our website at calvarysd.com give. Thank you so much and have a great day.